We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Bill Holter. He's a precious metals broker with Miles Franklin. Thanks for joining me today, Bill. Thank you, Reverend Tom. So you and I have both read this excellent book by Edward G. Griffin called The Creature from Jekyll Island. If anybody doesn't know, the, the basis of the book is the creation of the, the Federal Reserve and how it came into being. So how does that play into the situation that we find ourselves in today? You know, that, that book was written quite a long time ago about a situation that happened, you know, if I'm not mistaken, over a hundred years ago. So how does that relate to our, our world today? Yeah, the, the Fed was created uh, in 1913. It's an excellent book. If you have not read it, you absolutely should read it because it pretty much gives you what the game plan was. And the game plan, uh, if this was a baseball game, we're in the bottom of the ninth uh, with two outs. I mean, we're on that 100-year, 100-plus-year time frame, we are at the very end. Uh, the premise uh, basically is that having a central bank, they could get the system over-leveraged, raise interest rates, onto that leverage and collapse the system. It's basically about control of a country. And of course, the United States is, or and has been what has blocked uh, communism, fascism, socialism, whatever you want to call it. We've been the impediment. Now, if they take down the United States, the West goes, the, the whole world's financial system goes, and basically, it leaves those at the top with control of the global population. That's the plan. Mm -hmm. So how does M2 money growth, how does it relate to this? And what is the trend that we're currently seeing as well? Well, historically, uh, M2 or money supply historically has always grown. We're actually at a point right now where they've, they've begun to crash money supply, and it's actually shrinking for the first time, uh, possibly since the uh, since the Great Depression, since in the 1930s. Understand that the system, the global system, is a Ponzi scheme. The financial system must have, as any Ponzi scheme does, it must have new capital coming in in order to feed the previous investors. And as I mentioned uh, just a moment ago, what they've done is they've gotten the system completely over leveraged. There's too much debt outstanding. Mathematically, the debt can never be paid back in current terms. Mm -hmm. And step two was to raise interest rates, and they've done that. Uh, we're in the, in the sharpest interest rate rise period of time ever. And then you add to that the fact that they're that they're allowing M2 uh, money supply to crash and actually go negative, that's taking the lifeblood from the system. So to me, this whole thing looks like a plan and the, it looks to me like the plan is to completely collapse the system. So Bill, when we talk about the, the debt problem and how big it is, as you're saying, it can't mathematically be paid back, how do the derivatives relate to that? You know, they, they seem to be such an integral part of the system at this point. Is that one of the issues that could make this thing unravel at a very fast pace as well? Well, ultimately, derivatives will be what unravels the system, and it will be lightning speed. My guess is it will be uh, probably not much longer than a two or three day event before you go from what you think is normal to a world you don't even recognize. There's, they say that there's 350 trillion in debt globally, and that's based upon the real economy 
uh, roughly call it a hundred trillion. And then you've got derivatives. They're over two quadrillion dollars. Derivatives are bets on existing assets. They're bets on the weather. They're bets on you name it. The problem is with derivatives, there's, they're, they're individual contracts and there's a winner and there's a loser. And if the loser loses so big that they can't pay, then the winner also loses because he's not going to get paid. And that's the danger is that you get a, a domino effect or cascading effect, whatever you want to call it, that collapses the system because you have, uh, you have banks, you have brokers, you have central banks probably, uh, that have more, uh, more value in derivatives than they have equity. So if that, if the derivative blows up, you've got an insolvent entity. Mm-hmm. Bill, you were, you were mentioning that this is a plan to blow up the system. Is this, you know, more so a road to being able to introduce a CBDC or some type of social credit system as you see it, you know, relating to the the fight that America had against socialism, as you were mentioning. Yeah, the, the, it, absolutely. They're going to try to introduce uh, central bank digital currencies. There's no question about it. It's all about control. It's about totalitarianism. It's about uh, a surveillance state. It's about being able to shut you off, shut your bank account off, shut you off financially, which if you get shut off financially, how do you go to the store and get food even? Mm -hmm. So it's about total control. And yeah, central bank digital currency is part of it because if you're on uh, social media and you're espousing views that are contrary to the official narrative, all they do is push a button and they say, you're done. Mm -hmm. And unless you've prepared ahead of time, you're done. So as you you mentioned the official narrative there, what symptoms do you see that aren't necessarily reflected by this official narrative? Is the U.S. already in recession? Oh, I think, yeah, the U.S. is is in recession. Uh, Europe is in recession. Japan. Uh, I mean, all you have to do is is dig on the individual numbers. I mean, look at the inflation numbers. They're bogus. They're way too low. Look at the unemployment numbers. Well, what they tell you, what, a week or two weeks ago, uh, I forget which Federal Reserve District came out and said that, no, the 1.1 or 1.2 million jobs created, that wasn't true. It was only 10,000 jobs. I mean, pretty much... Every government statistic that comes out is complete bullshit. And all you have to do is is put a pencil to it, put common sense to it, and you know that what they're telling you is a lie. Yeah, it's interesting. I had a, a conversation yesterday about basically the loss of one full-time job. And if a person ends up going and getting three part-time jobs, the system sees that as a net gain of two jobs. That's not, that, that doesn't necessarily reflect a, a, an actual positive for the system or, or the, the population, right? Right. It's only one person and you could pretty much guess that the one permanent job paid more than, certainly paid more than two part-time jobs and maybe even three part-time jobs. Mm-hmm. So people are doing whatever they need to do to survive. And if that means taking a second and third job on, they got to do it. Bill, are you looking at the, let's say, the state of the consumer, the average consumer, by looking at, let's say, credit card debt or auto default rates, mortgage defaults? Are you seeing that that's really starting to, to get out of control as well? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, credit card uh, total credit outstanding is now at an all-time high. Uh, the auto boom that you saw a couple or a year and a half ago, uh, or even a year ago, it's gone from boom to now there's there's repos. Same thing with real estate. 
I mean, and, and this was all pre predictable because interest rates were basically zero and money was free. And now all of a sudden money's getting hard to, to come by. There is a cost to it because interest rates are going higher and you're beginning to see foreclosures. You're beginning to see repossessions. And this is just the start of, of a deflationary event, if you want to call it that. And we, we definitely will, we will see a huge deflationary event in front of us. And the re response by the central banks will be what they've always done, which is to uh, blow money back into the system, try to lower interest rates, and it's not going to work this time. There's too much debt outstanding. And the old fear that the Fed has had for 100 years is they're going to be pushing on a string. They're not going to be able to get that money into the system. But that money created is going to, you will see, you're going to see hyperinflation and massive deflation at the same time. The cost of the things that you need are going to go up drastically and the cost or value of the things that you have are going to collapse at the same time. So you will see inflation and deflation and you're already seeing it. I mean, we're living through uh, the cost of goods going higher and asset prices are beginning to deflate and devalue. Mm -hmm. I mean, last year alone was a horrendous year for stocks and bonds. And real estate. Real estate is definitely peaked. Mm -hmm. So, Bill, what is what does getting out of the system mean to you? Uh, it means that you become or or work to become as self sufficient as you possibly can. Getting out of the system. Uh, one thing it means is is you know becoming self reliant from a from a uh, survival standpoint. Do you have food stock? Can you grow food? Uh, do you have uh, domesticated, you know, like chickens, pigs, things like that? Uh, do you have the availability to shoot a deer, shoot a pig, whatever? Do you have the ability to procure food when grocery stores are closed? And when I say when grocery stores are closed, banks are going to close. And when that happens, everything's going to close. Mm -hmm. So for a time, I don't know, two weeks, two months, you know, God forbid, six months or more, you're going to see a system that is closed and you're going to have what you have and that's all you have. Now, as far as getting your assets out of the system, if you own stocks, you want to get the stock certificate, hold it in your hand. Uh, if you have a bank account or insurance product, you're looking at entities that are, that are going to bankrupt. And that will fuel a migration into gold and silver. When I say migration, I should say flood. It will fuel a flood into gold and silver because those are the only two monies on the planet that cannot bankrupt. So basically, you want as few intermediaries between you and your money. You don't want to be, you don't want to have your account shut off. And if you've got gold in hand or silver in hand, you can't be shut off because you have wealth. Mm -hmm. So really the whole idea is to become as self-sufficient as you possibly can. And that also includes, I know I was talking about food. It also talks about, think about water, think about power. What if your utility goes down? What are you going to do? So you need to plan for these things ahead of time because they are coming. Bill, you know, you, you talk about the banks being, shut off and you know the the financial censorship that we've seen for example in Canada last year and also also for certain individuals seem to be really something that is maybe a distant memory for people at this point so should this be a lesson for most people and something that we could see more of in the years ahead well you mentioned what happened in Canada last in truckers and if you posted on Facebook or if you gave even five dollars to the truckers your bank account got frozen. So really what they did there was they tipped their hand. They told you what they're going to do in the future. And yeah, use it as a warning. Plan ahead. Make sure you cannot be shut off and end up with nothing. 
So let's take another example, and that's maybe BlackRock stopping withdrawals from their from their REITs. Is this that's the not, same the same game of blocking the exit for people that chose to invest in a in a program like that? Yeah, exactly. Uh, we saw it in two thousand eight with money markets. Uh, uh, one or two money markets broke the buck, broke the dollar when you know traded down at ninety nine cents or ninety eight or whatever. And once that started to happen, they shut the gates. No, you can't have your money. And that's that's going to be a big problem. The, the problem is the entire globe is going to bankrupt. We are living in a world that is in the process of defaulting. So, Bill, you you, you also mentioned that you want to hold your, your stock certificates. Why right. why would you want to do that? Like, what what is the the mechanism that that helps you there, or what are you guarding from in that case? Well, what you're guarding from is your broker going bankrupt because if your if your stock is in street name, it's not in your name; it's on the balance sheet of your broker. So if your broker goes down, you don't have access to your stocks. If they go through bankruptcy, even in normal times, if they're not merged with another firm. In normal times, it could take three to five years to you for you to get the availability of your shares. If you have your shares in hand and there's still a market that's up and running and there are still brokers that are, are in business, you walk into a new broker's office, deposit the shares and sell them. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what I was saying before is you don't want intermediaries between you and your money. Mm -hmm. Right. So, Bill, we see a fight in, let's say, the Senate right now with Republicans trying to introduce a bill to abolish the IRS and replace it with a national sales tax. Do you think that this is would be a step in the right direction? Uh, That's a really broad topic. I don't think a national sales tax uh, in a form, yes. A a sales tax, a a flat tax, if you will, people will will look at it and say, oh, well, that's not fair because it hits the lower class more. Um, But I think it, yeah, I would would personally say yes. Uh, You do want to move toward a flat tax, a national sales tax, and away from what, you know, what the current system is right now. Yeah, I think one one real perk of that would be just simplifying the tax code quite a bit, which which would, I think, greatly aid in most people just being able to work in that system, right? Right. Um, but you're not going to see that anytime soon. I mean, you have a Republican uh, Congress and you have a, a Democrat Senate and a Democrat president. You're not going to see anything get done. Mm-hmm. So that that won't happen. And within the next two years, this whole thing's going to come down and collapse before they can get anything else in place. Mm-hmm. And also understand, just understand that for years and years, when I say years and years, I'm talking 40 years, the amount of interest that the federal government was paying on the debt, and this is in the U.S., was between 350 and $450 billion, year after year after year. The debt continually increased, the interest rates continually decreased, and they were able to keep that number between 350 and 450, maybe as high as 500. Now we're at a point where the just the interest alone is over a trillion dollars a year. And we're up to you know $32 trillion now in, in total debt. And that's just the debt that's on books. That's not all the promises. You're looking at $200 trillion. Mm-hmm. Of, of total uh, debt, promises, guarantees, et cetera. You know, you, you mentioned the basically the, the two opposing parties that control the Senate and the Congress and, and the fact that they're really blocking each other from getting much of anything done for the next two years, minus the ability of the, the president to veto any of those bills. Is that ultimately a good thing, do you think? Uh, yes. It, yes, if it was real, but you need to understand that we, it's really not two parties. They're all one. They're all the same party. It's Kabuki theater. 
It's to get people to start screaming about left, right, left, right, Mm -hmm. Democrat, Republican, whatever. Um, If you look at, if you really look at it, they're pretty much all on the same team, but it's, it's sleight of hand to get people to think, oh, well, if we have all Republicans in, everything will be fine. Or if we have all Democrats in, you know, then things will be better. They've, they've walked hand in hand all these years. Where are we? You know, we've had Republican uh, president, Congress, Senate. We've had the same thing with Democrat. But where are we? We're bankrupt. It's over. Well, you know, Bill, exactly as you're as you're talking about the amount of outstanding debt we have, you know, the, the last time we spoke, the Senate had just introduced the Inflation Reduction Act to the tune of $750 billion. And now it was just recently announced the, the new budget was $1.7 trillion. So is this the go, the road the government will continually have to keep walking down of bigger and bigger debts and deficit spending before inflating the currency into oblivion here? Well, they kind of go hand in hand. The, you know, too much debt uh, equals a lower currency. Uh, as far as as, as far as uh, the debt that's outstanding, it cannot be paid in current dollars. What they're going to have to do is they're going to have to devalue. Now, that would be under normal times. The question is, will will the system even remain? What's the system going to look like? They are already telling you that they want to do a reset. They want to change what the system looks like. I don't think anybody really knows exactly what uh, the system will look like. You know, they may have uh, enough of an idea to know what 60, 70 percent of it's going to look like. But there's so much. You mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act. How do you spend seven hundred fifty billion dollars? And that reduces inflation. That's a perfect example of what we were talking about before. Whenever they, whatever they tell you is bullshit because you, they should just call it the inflation act. (laughs) It's not going to reduce inflation. Mm -hmm. I mean, every act that they come out with, it's got a nice title and you just start reading it, actually reading the bill itself. And you find out, Oh, this is not good. It's not a, it's the opposite of what the title says. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, we live in a, in a, a make-believe world where living standards are far higher than they should be. We've lived beyond our means for 30, 40, 60 years. And it, it's all going to come home to roost here. Mm-hmm. So how does this debt and, and spending look to the rest of the world? You know, Russia recently announced that their sovereign wealth fund is going to double its allowable gold and yuan holdings. So is this a big deal in the grand scheme of things, or is this just a relative drop in the bucket? No, it's huge. I mean, just look at what foreign nations are doing. They're cutting deals with China in yuan. Russia's doing deals with other countries in rubles. Russia is buying gold. China's buying gold. India's buying gold. You have central banks all over the world that are are buying gold. And the reason being, the United States, for years and years and years, has broken every promise, every deal we've ever made. They don't want to do business that way. They don't want to be forced to use the dollar because of the U.S. military, you know, with a gun at their head. So, yeah, it's a huge deal. This is the end of Bretton Woods. Bretton Woods 2 has already begun to form. And I, I mean, all you have to do is, is look at uh, look at the uh, Arab nations. Saudi Arabia just cut a, a long-term deal with China. They've cut deals uh, already with Russia. They have a, uh, Russia, China, they have a system that's already being used that can replace the SWIFT system. So it's no longer, the world is no longer the United States sandbox per se you've got nations that are extremely irritated and don't like the the way the united states does business so they're not doing business with us and just the last two months the uh, 
for the United States, the uh, import export, the, the deficit has shrunk dramatically. Well, what does that tell you? It tells you less goods. It's not about the export side. It's about the import side. There's less goods coming into the United States. And when this system breaks and basically everyone has to fend for themselves, what exactly gets made in the United States for us to consume? Not a whole heck of a lot. Mm -hmm. And and the problem will be uh, country XYZ is going to say, yeah, we make these widgets and we're willing to sell them to you, but we don't accept dollars. So what happens there? There's there's the collapse of the dollar right there. Mm-hmm. You have you've already got nations that are are getting rid of their dollars simply because they no longer need them to purchase oil because the Arabs are accepting currencies other than dollars. So, you know, Bill, if if we're seeing this as, you know, the real not necessarily the beginning of, but the real start of the symptoms of watching the dollar really slide and, and collapse. Do you think it's going to be at all useful to to think in terms or, or in dollar terms of what gold and silver will ultimately be revalued in? <laughs> uh, I think the best way to answer that question is you should think yourself in terms of ounces as opposed to dollars Mm -hmm. because when this is all said and done people will end up counting their net worth in ounces of gold and ounces of silver excellent bill well i think that's a reasonable place to wrap up today's conversation was there anything else you wanted to mention before we do um no i think we we covered pretty good amount covered some good ground excellent and of course, you're you're now available as a broker through Miles Franklin. Is that right? Yeah, I've been a broker for years with Miles Franklin. If you you can go to milesfranklin.com to contact me, or you can go uh, if you want to contact me directly. My email address is bholter at hotmail dot com. Excellent. Thanks for your time today, Bill. Thank you for having me back, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.